Uh, as you can see, it's a relatively compact group. And the reason for that is we are going against ETH, we are going against Ganesh Chaturthi, we are going against Salesforce, and we are going against VMworld. But I think the most important of these is obviously I want to wish Eid Mubarak to all of you and also to uh, tell you about the fact that we are probably in the week of Ganesh Chaturthi. So Vish has declared this a very auspicious sort of session. So welcome to all of you. So the Thai, uh, as an organization, as you know, is dedicated to entrepreneurship. We also teach. We also provide forums for networking. We provide you with education. And we certainly help you with dedicated programs in all the different areas that are hot and current in the current market. And this organization, while it's a nonprofit, has grown to about 54 chapters worldwide. And all of them are doing something in the area of entrepreneurship with the local flavor attached to the word entrepreneurship. But we have the distinct honor tonight that we have two of the early members of Thai, and both of them are presidents, one of whom uh, has been a president before, one is a president currently, and one was an early founder of Thai, the other is still the president and was a founder of Thai. So with, without further ado, let me introduce Kailash Joshi. Would you please stand up? And Vish Mishra, who is the current president of Thai Silicon Valley. Welcome. So Thai has a number of stakeholders. As you know, we have sponsors without whom these programs wouldn't happen. We have a number of charter members who are people in the valley that have demonstrated some sort of accomplishment in their own right and have earned the right to become members as charter members of this organization, of some of our Thai affiliates worldwide, and of course you, the members. So this is very, very important that we acknowledge all three different constituents, and we welcome all of you today. There are a number of charter members in the room. Could you please raise your hand? That will be interesting to see. Thank you. And please seek these people out. These are good people to network. I see Kailash raising his hand at the last minute. <laughs> he forgot. Uh, but these are good people to network with, good people to talk to, and perhaps will be good mentors when you decide to use them as mentors. So on to tonight's session. Tonight's session is for a different group of people, people that are not actually pursuing a career directly associated with entrepreneurship. We are looking at how people can actually climb up the corporate ladder as it might be in a corporate world. We're thinking about getting promoted, we're thinking about getting, um, staying in their jobs or moving to other jobs. There are a number of different aspects to this, but ultimately it's about surviving and gaining credibility and growing within an organization that you're part of. So I welcome you because you're a slightly different community within our broad ecosystem, and it's a very important subject for us to address. So thank you again for coming. So I will, first of all, before the session tonight, I just want to tell you the bathrooms are over on the right. Please switch off your cell phones for those of you who have not done it. Your cell phone should go on vibrate so that you don't disturb us. And please interact with us because the purpose of having such a small compact group is that you can actually engage with the people on stage, ask them the tough questions, ask them your dilemmas, be brief and accept their answers and then later on seek them out if you want clarification. Without saying more about this, let me ask the panel to join me on the stage. Kailash, Vic, Dilip, Farhat, Anywhere is fine. So this evening, I am not going to go through a very formal introduction of these gentlemen. They are so accomplished that that will occupy 20 minutes if I try to do it. But I will tell you, first of all, Dr. Kailash Joshi has been the president of this organization. He's one of the early founders. 
and he has done a lot for this organization, which is a non-profit, and has done a lot for the community. He's involved still with a number of community programs. But his claim to fame came when he was general manager of an IBM division, and he is broadly known as the person who took IBM to India. So please join me in welcoming Kailash. Dilip Saraf is a CEO coach and a coach for a lot of you looking for career growth in the Valley. He doesn't restrict himself to CEOs, but has been very effective because he's gone through three career transitions himself and has a lot of wisdom to offer you based on your experiences, your problems, and has helped people find jobs, has helped people recruit themselves into companies, and has helped people get promoted. So please join me in welcoming Dilip Saraf, a noted author. Thank you. <laughs> and Farhat Ali is the president of Fujitsu America. He's a newly inducted charter member in Thai Silicon Valley. So without further ado, welcome. And finally, Vic Mahadevan, who is currently the Senior Vice President of Strategy at NetApp. But he made his name as one of the founding or early team at Compaq. And he was the one who was one of the people that helped build Compaq into a gigantic powerhouse before it was sold. He's a, a person often that I describe as somebody who you knows storage. He's from the storage world. And uh, more importantly, he's my classmate from IIT Madras. And as for me, I have actually worked mostly in the East Coast. So I actually, like Kailash, built much of my early corporate career in the East Coast and then came out west to encounter the problems and tragedies and opportunities and growth of Silicon Valley. And I have seen what the East Coast is like. I've seen a 400,000 company. I've seen a 100,000 company. And then in the Valley, I was the president and CEO of a supply chain company that I ended up growing to a fairly large size, nearly a billion dollars. So that's my role. And I'm also the moderator today. So I'm going to start off by telling Dilip to share with us, if he could, the problems that he has now seen in the Valley from those of you who have approached him. He has seen uh, thousands of clients go through his office. I want him to share with us the typical problems that he sees as people go about getting promoted, go about getting new jobs, and those of you who are feeling stuck. So, Dilip. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I had a slide. Is that... Uh, Oh, okay. Just one slide. Yeah, so let me just give you a brief background here. Uh, this is actually my fifth career. I've gone through four very different careers, starting as an engineer and leaving the corporate world as head of engineering and program management at a division of Varian about 23 years ago. And as a result of these career changes, I've 25 years ago, there were no career coaches. So I had to kind of bootstrap myself to figure out how to make a transition in a whole different area that you're not familiar with. It was very hard initially, but as it got you know, to the second and the third and the fourth, it got easier. And the lucky thing that happened for me in 2001 is when the valley went down, the valley tanked, I had already gone through four career changes. So I said, who better to show people how to reinvent themselves than to actually use the what I had learned and sort of codify it to apply to people. And since then, I have worked with about 5,000 people globally. And I've learned a lot by doing this in a kind of a everyday practice. So I want to share some of those things with you. And, oh, thanks. And it's only one slide. So the common problems I see people facing in the corporate world is stuck in one place. And this is, I think, more common as you go up. Like, for example, if you go from individual contributor to manager, people rise fairly quickly. But once you go from manager to director, it gets harder. And director on and up gets even harder. And later on, I'll tell you what are two unique transition points you should be aware of in making these transitions from, say, manager to a director and director to an executive position. So that's one thing that I see 
with a lot of my clients. They stuck in one place. The second thing I see is making only lateral moves. So you, you try to move up to you know a, a higher position and you say, okay, the only place I can move is some other group and you stay there for a year or two and then it turns out that you're not moving up in that group either. And, and so consequently you keep moving in the same kind of a level and don't go much beyond where you were. Now these are actual examples that I have seen having gone through about 5,000 clients. This is somewhat in a hierarchical order. This is in a rank order. The third one I see is cannot get juicy assignments. You seem to be stuck doing assignments that you're not that careful, that interested in or not that exciting in terms of where the career will take you. New boss every few months. How many of you share that? Six months, nine months, one year, two years. And some of the people I know haven't had a review for three or four years because every six months they have a new boss. And consequently, there's no calibration that they have on, on, on the people who report to them. And at the mercy of impending layoffs, there's constant fear of layoffs. So people, when they know that there are layoffs coming, they kind of hunker down and they make themselves invisible so that they don't become on the top of the list of layoffs. And this is one of the things that I find very counterintuitive that we'll talk about a little later. So these are some of the things that I have seen in my encounter with clients as priorities in which people need to address their career needs. So is that Thank good you. enough for Thank you. start up with you? Thank you. Kailash, you want to tell us a little bit about your wisdom for us? I keep prepared. <laughs> So I, uh, well, good evening and welcome. And Murali, thank you for choosing a very auspicious day for this seminar. So hopefully there will be some good benefit and some gains for everybody. Uh, you know, I challenged myself. I said, no, I want to put down my, Dilip and I are the natural gray hair people, right? <laughs> but he and I conducted the first Tycon. We had, a, I think we chair, I chaired a seminar on Human resource or yeah, some team, and you were part of the panel there. So I told him to go back and look at the, what we talked about then and see if we've changed. <laughs> so that'd be interesting to compare. Uh, so I said, you know, what I want to do is put down on a page and uh, give myself a very short time to uh, spell out for you what this gray hair has sort of assembled in this entire frame and share it with you for your benefit. And uh, so I want to do that. and. It's really the corporate ladder. That's really the theme we're talking about. So first of all, you must know that there is a ladder. Sometimes there may not be a ladder. You know, you're sort of in a, in a terrain. So you want to make sure there is a ladder that you're aspiring for, and others also know that there's a ladder that you can aspire for. So that's very important that what you recognize. That's called a career path. Whatever you do, make sure there's a career path ahead of you and a potential to get there. So that's the first point I want to make. Oh, uh, Make you about, uh, and then what I, what I thought is I would make a, uh, you know, it's really a very subjective ensemble of our experiences, our observations, and thoughts. It's kind of a salad bowl, you know. You make a nice, rich salad. So I'm going to give you my salad bowl, okay? So you can take it, whatever, and you can mix and match. And it's just, so there's no ne 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 need to understand that every component has to be there. But these are generally the four fundamental uh, thing that I think that come into play in building a career, no matter what you do, upwards, being happy, satisfied, growing, all those things, it also enriches your life. So I'm going to give you four very different components, and these components are, I call them attitude, number one. How do you look at things around you? How do you look at life? How do you look at the world? So I give you three components of attitude that are pertinent to a career. Then I'll talk about relationship management. And I'll give you three components of that that are very important. Then comes a question of style, of how we conduct ourselves. And I'll give you three components of style. And finally, I'll give you three basic skills. That salad ball, if you have a mix of those, I can almost guarantee you, you will have a very good career ahead of you. And you will move quite rapidly. And that is from personal experiences and also from observing many successful people that I had association with. 
over my many, many years. Other encouraging thing is that these things can be adopted, learned, and if you're conscious, developed. So you're not born with these. You can develop these qualities and characteristics if you're conscious and really sincere about your growth. So that's another point I want to make to you. And one more point, that if you possess these and develop these qualities, you will generally enrich your lives. Your family life, your friendships, they are good qualities to have. So it doesn't take unique, you know, you don't have two different lives, you know, one for career and one for home. You know. It all sort of comes together as you as a person. Okay, so now, first thing, I would like to have my, my only slide. Could you please put it up? Somebody. Oh, it's here. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, by the way, this is not my creation, but some, some, somebody had this wisdom. I, I liked it because it sort of speaks my mind. Now, I, I don't want to argue about all the timelines on different matters here. You know, it says if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. Right? Uh, if you want happiness for a day, go to a picnic. No, oh, okay. Uh, if you want happiness for a week, go for a vacation. If you want happiness for a month, get married. Well, I'm not sure about that. I won't touch that anymore. <laughs> Happiness for a year, inherit wealth. Maybe it's longer, I don't know. But if you want happiness for a lifetime, learn to love what you do. So if there's one takeaway I have for you today, if there's one takeaway I have for you today, that is the takeaway. If you don't do that, forget about career growth, forget about ladders and stairs and all those things, they don't exist. You'll be miserable, and it's a very bad place to be in life be miserable on your life, on your jobs. So that's basically my only chart, and I won't bore you anymore, so we can just turn that off. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna to talk, to talk to you about three attitudes that I like to talk about. By the way, this is one of my very favorite subjects, so I'm, I'm kind of in my thing here. I've studied it, I've observed it, so, so I'm gonna kind of spill it out, and I hope I don't take other people's time here too long. Uh, okay, attitude, first one is right there. You gotta enjoy what you do. That's an attitude. Uh, you have to go whistling into work. I tell people, are you a whistler or non-whistler? Seventy percent of the people in the world hate their jobs and their occupations. Just think about that. Seventy percent of the people on the universe hate what they do. That is a very bad situation, unfortunately, and there's no cure for it. There's no hospitals. There's no jobists. There's no job uh, doctors. Just people suffer from that problem. The second item is what I call the insider versus outsider view. If you go into work as <laughs> they and me, then the victim mentality, victim mentality, you're going to be victimized. If you go in and say, you know, I want to know. How, how do they go in the boardroom? What goes on there? I want to know. It's called an insider. So you have to shift your thinking into being an insider gradually. When you walk and there's paper on the floor, pick it up. That's your company. That is a very significant aspect of you belonging to an institution or being on the outside. So that attitude of being on the inside gradually will get you in the right place. And the third one is I called, uh, as my fond uh, description of attitude, what I call a surgeon's attitude. So most people walk into the world, they don't whistle, and they usually have four letter words. In fact, I was thinking, you know, it'd be interesting if you could digitize in a, in a company, people coming in, if you could digitize the verbiage that is going on through brains and play it out on a loudspeaker, <laughs> it would be pretty nasty. Seventy percent negative, you know? Okay, so a surgeon, a surgeon gets up in the morning, okay? And you know what the surgeon says? I hope it's a good day for me. I want to have some tough surgeries. Some easy ones, some difficult ones. I hope I'm at the best of my, my abilities. My mind is sharp. My hands are good. My staff is cooperative. All the instruments are working fine. That's how a surgeon goes into the work. Surgeon doesn't say, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> the boss doesn't say hello to me. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So a surgeon's attitude, if you want, if you want to remind yourself going into work every morning and say, I want to charge up and go positive, Think of a surgeon, and you will know what I'm talking about. So the attitude is, enjoy what you do, number one, develop insider's attitude, and a surgeon's mindset. 
That is attitude part of it. Done. Now we're going to relationship management. And the biggest relationship you have to manage is your family, your spouse. If they are not supportive of your job, you've got a problem. Forget about ladders, forget about stairs. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a problem. You have to have a supportive system and you have to communicate. And by the way, you don't go home and go home and say, oh, what a bad day again. Terrible boss again. Then the spouse is going to say, why are you working there? <laughs> out of there. You're bothering me too. So you have to bring pleasantries in the home, not headaches and not a pain. So your family relationship as, we st as relate to your occupation become extremely important. There are times when you'll be traveling days on end, you'll not be seeing your children. There's a lot of talk. You have to explain why that is important, and I hope they understand. And you know, I, mean, I, I used to, just in my IBM days, I used to send flowers to the, my subordinates, their spouses. I used to send big bouquets of roses because I said, oh, thank you for allowing Jim to stay in Europe for all 10 days. Boy, those, they love it. They say, wow, what a wonderful. But you have to have that appreciation for them. Without their support, there's no careers. Okay, marriage isn't good there. Uh, so the family support. The second aspect is you have to manage your manager. You know what that is? How many people know how to manage your manager in this room? Okay. Can you tell me quickly what that means? Which means which means you manage his expectations plus you do a lot of work which which is botheration for him. So you you offload that. Good, that's a good part of it. Basically, you go to your manager and say, I want to see you Monday. And you say, Charlie, I've been thinking. I think I should shift my emphasis. This should be my job from now on. And uh, I need the following support from you. Rather than he's saying, oh, you should do this and you should do that. You shift, shift the vector and tell the manager what you should do. And that way what happens is they begin to see your initiative, your leadership. They leave you alone. You get your independence and you are on your own. Okay. So that is a very subtle way to manage. Do not be subordinated by any human being. You should be your own boss. So that is a very subtle thing, and I can, if somebody wants to talk to me about it later on, I'll be happy to share with you a little bit more of that, uh, any of these ideas. I'm, I'm taking too long time? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, and the third one is very important, is your peer group. Uh, the people who promote you are your peers. If they respect you as an expert, as a great human being, that perfume has a tendency to go all the way up. And upper management say, you know, uh, among these group of uh, directors, who is the most respected? Oh, he's an SVP. So the peer respect and how you get along with your peers, inside work and outside, also go to parties and have your beer and all that stuff. Very important to build that relationship with your peers in a very positive way. Families getting together, children getting together, do it. It's very powerful. And the third one, uh, yeah, okay, so the family support, Manager, manager, and the peer support. That is the relationship management, those three relationships. Then we come into your style. And the biggest thing I found, I have found in my uh, experience, is people who are able to separate facts from opinions. Facts from opinions. We tend to make a mix and don't take time to differentiate between those two. So gossips become facts, and uh, innuendos become facts, this company is going to help. Charlie is going somewhere, nowhere. I mean, all kind of garbage. This gossip business is bad. People in the water fountain who are you know, spreading bad rumors, stay away from them. Coffee machine, I mean, IBM, we have this water fountain, coffee machine, people, you know, older employees, and they will uh, get the younger employees and say, hey, did you know we have a problem there? All kind of, un I know, <coughs> untrue stuff. And these young guys, they get, you know, impacted by that. So I used to tell these young engineers when they came, Avoid the, <laughs> the water fountain, avoid the coffee machine, particularly if there are older folks standing there. Quickly <laughs> come out, get your coffee, go back to your work. A lot of garbage. A lot of garbage gets... Uh, gets uh, <laughs> That's right. So, facts separate. Just try it out, you know. He says, you know, this is happening, you know, this goes on about Obama, about this. People throw a lot of things. How do you know? You know, I heard you know, this guy is, uh, you know, worth $3 trillion he stole from 
How do you know? Who told you this? Did you see the books? No, 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 I heard. Oh, okay, who's he? You know, so you get carried away. So make sure you put your brakes on before you get your thinking into that flight. The facts and opinion separation is very important for executives particularly, because you can make wrong decisions with them, just opinions, right? So, number one. Uh, second one is delegation and multitasking. Now, delegation means you don't micromanage. You know, you do what you can, you're good at, but then you pass on to others that work with you, with, with, for you, and delegate as much as you can, so you also grow them. You want them to replace you. You want to work for some of them. They're much brighter, they've moved them forward in the career in a corporation particularly. We used to have uh, an idea we call the early eyes, early identification young people. We, we, our job was to move them fast in the career path, so they could become a CEO someday, faster than us. That is a very novel uh, objective in good companies it is practiced very well. So delegation is very important, and multitasking, be able to handle lot of, have a lot of balls in the air, you know, at the same time. It's very important. If you want, if you aspire to ride the, this, you know, climb this ladder, that is a very important aspect. You will have financial issues, human resource issues, legal issues, products and customers, everywhere thing floating in the air. And you have to stay on top of it with a due delegation and then reporting back and make the decisions fast. That's very important from a style point of view and tough but fair. You've got to be tough, but also fair. Demand for people, but you've got to be fair. That you're not being unfair to anybody, or you're not discriminating people, and based on whatever uh, reasons and all that stuff. So on the style side, and by the way, people perceive these. When they see you in action, they know. Are you a, are you a fair person? Are you tough, but tough and fair? Uh, you know, are you, you know, do you delegate or not? Are you a micromanager? Bad news, the micromanager is the worst thing. You can kill people's careers, you can kill projects. And the separating facts and opinions. You know, are you swayed by opinions, or do you ask for facts? People see them. Your style becomes very obvious and visible to people. And the last thing I want to talk about very quickly is the three skills. First one is a effective communications. It means you speak clearly, write clearly, crisp, timely, don't delay, uh, and very effectively you communicate, not verbose. Also a touch of humor, if you can afford it, and if you have it, Throw it out there, people love it. Uh, so the communication style is very important, the skill. Uh, second one is balance sheet. I think you, everybody, I believe, everybody should be a master at reading and interpreting a balance sheet. Because that is the heart of financial decisions for any business. Your decisions have an effect on people, whatever. You have to come back and say, okay, what does it do to the balance sheet? In terms of the assets and liabilities and inventories and all kind of stuff. So understanding balance sheet is a very good skill to possess for everybody. I recommend that no matter what you are, whether you're in human resource or whatever, understanding that is a good idea. And the last one is called asking good questions. Ask good questions. Because, and you can also answer, provide good answers, but typically people who provide good answers work for people who ask good questions. Think about that. <laughs> so the one quality of a person who becomes a CEO of a company is that that person asks beautiful questions. People say, ah, oh, I didn't think of that. Good question. One good question from a person can turn the entire direction of a company. One good question. Send 1,000 people into different assignments. One good question. So that is a very significant. And by the way, it requires a lot of analytics, information, understanding. So you don't ask good questions just from nowhere. You have done a lot of internalizing and mulling and absorbing of information. So those are my three attitudes, three relationship management, three personal style, three key skills. And I think I should stop right here. I've taken more than my share of time. Thank you. Thank you. very interesting. The two things I actually have done. But if I go to a bathroom in my company, mm -hmm. I don't care where the paper is falling, I do pick it up and put it in the garbage. And the second thing, when smoking was common, 
If anybody smoked, when I walked in near the door, any smoke box, right, lying on, I pictured myself, even as a CEO of my company, and I put it in. And I think it is very interesting that it, what it really needs you first, it shows that it's your company, very, very important, but it also people don't realize that it shows a great deal of humility and a great deal of courage. Because people think it's easy for a CEO to pick up the paper. It actually is not. You know, what will this guy think? But you have to believe in it. And, and so my talk centers more about leadership, right? You know, what's behind it. I think uh, Kala did a very good job of, you know, structuring. I'm going to say, what are the thought processes behind it? So it's, it's more got to do with that. So with that, uh, let me figure out how to run this. So I want to set the stage, talk about the beliefs uh, uh, and, and guidelines for success. And most of it, some of you might not be popular guys, it also applies to entrepreneurship. The biggest, the biggest difference between entrepreneurship and corporate success at the high level is that I think entrepreneurs are profits. They are trying to create their own realities, right? which is good. And I think corporation is all about being a statesman, where communication, all of the skills, uh, Kailash talked about is very relevant. And so think about statesmen. If you want to be that, that's what you are. Most part, corporate is the right way. If you want to create new realities, right? then maybe it's entrepreneurship. All right. So introduction, now, setting the stage in what's going on uh, is basically all about globalization. Uh, you know, this is me, Pakistan is leading a Japanese company in the USA, right? <laughs> Interesting fact is my direct reports were all senior VPs reporting to me, I had 14 of them, from eight different countries, and only three of them were what I would call white Americans, right? I had Japanese, Portuguese, Canadians, Mexicans, you name it. And, and I think, especially in the Valley, that's a very good representation. So people always thought, I can't grow, it's a discrimination, I'll talk about that, right? It's actually the worst discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> right, Indians, hang to it. Uh, all right, so, so first belief, and I think, uh, Kailash, you kind of touched on it also. I absolutely believe that everyone, irrespective of your physical and mental capacity, has an opportunity to succeed. And everyone has areas they cannot excel in. No matter how hard I try, I cannot be a good basketball player, right? And so there are lots of jobs I cannot do. But the fact is, everyone has areas they can excel in. And I think that's the key, right? And you can only do it if you have two qualities, determination and perseverance in your area of passion. If you don't have passion, you cannot persevere, right? And I think all the details, again, Kailash talked about your family support and all comes in. But passion and determination are the two keys. So the next question is, you know, to be successful, you must grow, right? And there is no middle ground. So if you if you ever come to work and you say, oh, you know, things are going well, there's nothing for me to do, or you know, I've already grown, I already know it, you've lost. It. Okay. In nature, you either grow, whether you are an animal or a leaf or a human being, right? Or you are starting to kink. There is no middle. Then the question really is, if that is true, how do you continue to grow? By the way, a separate item, which I skipped in the middle, since some people know I grow a wines, uh, uh, I have a vineyard, right? That the fact really is, at any age you can grow. So if you actually look at a vineyard, right, it's the new growth which gives you the best fruit, right? So you've got to be continually shedding and continually pruning. So that's what growth is all about. But how do you go do it? And I think, the, or the way to achieve it is you must put yourself in an uncomfortable position, right? Physically standing in front of a big crowd like here or whatever it be, right? Because if you cannot stretch, you cannot grow, all right? So those two or two beliefs are applies a corporate person, whatever you. Now, to achieve that growth, there are three separate tracks for growth. The first track is acquisition skills. Lots of engineers here, we know all about it. Go to good school, get good education, be a, you know, what have you. I think everybody kind of understands that well. And I think uh, most of us are very good at it. Acquisition of relevant experiences, right? So you, you got the skills, you do, you learn in the job, you create knowledge. The issue there is it's going to be relevant and it should not be repetitive. So again, you touched on it, right? You can keep doing the same job again and again, you go you're not growing, right? A lot of activity is not growth. Being uncomfortable is growth. It means you must go into new situations. 
The third part is actually what I'm most passionate about, is understanding of human nature. Unfortunately, at least, uh, uh, especially if you've gone to school in India or Pakistan, or have you, right? They do not understand how important it is as an undergraduate to take courses in psychology and more important, philosophy. Because psychology still is a science. Okay? And human nature is all about philosophy. And, and understanding of human nature is the key. And I think that's a part. Uh, uh, because in business, people do work with people. So, getting down to more basics, what does it mean to be successful, right? So one is hiring, right? So if you put it together, what are the three criteria for hiring? Most people may not realize they do three, three things. Passion, we talked about it. Competency, the skill levels. And the third one, which is not understood, is called fit. You can have different styles and different ways of doing it, but you must fit. So think about a marriage, okay? You know, you want your daughter to get married. I have a 26-year-old. Um, uh, and so you say, okay, you know, the other guy, if he's married, he must have passion for her, love, that's important, right? And competency, you know, we better be an engineer, doctor, or somebody who can make a lot of money, that's good, <laughs> right? But the other criteria which is equally important is how does he fit? How does he fit with the family, right? So, so corporations are gigantic organizations, in fact, America declared, right, that uh, corporations can vote or uh, participate in politics. But anyhow, uh, so the important thing is a fit is very important. And people, uh, and that's, that's the one we need to concentrate on. Now, if you've gotten a good job, going back and changing it from a leadership perspective, what do good leaders and managers do? This is from Lou Holtz, uh, coach of Notre Dame long time ago. Three very simple principles. The first principle is, do you care about me as an individual? I don't give a damn about it. Do you care about me as an individual? If you care, then I want to work for the person. The second one is do you create an environment for me to be my very best? You know, this is the micromanaging, all of those things. But it's a fundamental requirement that everybody wants to have an environment where they can reach the full potential, whatever it would be. And the third one is, if the first two are correct, which are much more critical, is are you fair? Do you reward me, recognize me fairly? And so as a leader, I think those are the three qualities. Now to stop, uh, this is my last slide, uh, uh, which kind of summarizes my thinking about kind of five uh, maxims, I call them. Uh, discrimination is a crutch. I don't know whether this is discrimination or not, right? All I can tell you, I told you in the first sheet of paper, right? Uh, everybody discriminates, you know, I, I talk to my daughter, right? I, I'm discriminated, very discriminatory you know, into my future son-in-law, right? So discrimination, I don't really care in good, bad, indifferent, change it to grow. But it's a crutch, and the only thing you should worry about there is whether you only hang around with people like yourself. So it could only be reverse discrimination could be a problem. The second one we talked about, if everybody putting 80%, 100%, you put 120%, you'll rise above the crowd, right? Because when there are five to be selected, right, this is the bare story. When the bear comes to eat you, if you run faster than the other guy, you're okay. <laughs> All right, so, so it's very simple. So give 120% or give more than your group, you come up. This one, I guess, a slightly different way I said it than what uh, Kailash mentioned, is make your boss look good. He's the guy who promotes you, right? That's what gets into your system. Uh, uh, and most, most people don't realize that these groups of people hang together. Your boss is going to go to a new company because he's going to get a promotion and take you with you. That's how you get promoted. All right. So, so making a boss look good as opposed to making you look good is actually what you're trying to do. You know, whether you solve his biggest problem, you know, which, which was mentioned there, or whatever. Okay. People do business with people. Right? You could be the world's best technologist. I don't really care. My only question is, do I want to be next to you? If, I'm, if you're going to be in, around me all day and, you know, it doesn't work, right? It, it, so being competent is a necessary condition, but the sufficient condition is the fit. And finally, right, uh, very, very important, people love, by the way, I had a choice to be a doctor or an engineer. I chose being an engineer. They said doctors, the only deal with people who are unhappy with problems, and I only want to deal with people who are happy. By the way, that was my logic, which may or may not be true, because every day is a great day, okay? There are no exceptions. When you as a leader walk out of your room because your wife calls you and tells you your daughter's fallen or whatever the issue is, right? And you go out with the you know, stuff, right? Or you close the door because you want to talk. They think 
a ref is coming. They don't know. Okay? So you don't realize the impact as a leader you have. All right? And so every day is a great day. We go to work to enjoy. That's the only reason we go there. We spend a hell of a lot of time at it, right? And we love what we do. Thank you very much. Well, you know, uh, my friends, uh, a famous economist once said that it's increasingly difficult to make a prediction, especially about the future. But I like Steve Jobs' comment, which is, uh, you know, the best way to predict the future is to help invent it. And really, by choosing to come here on an evening, on a Wednesday evening, you've already shown the leadership to really learn and, and understand how you can move forward in your careers. So I want to start about what I truly believe in is that life is fundamentally all about leadership, period. And I'd like to tell a little story about uh, leadership that uh, I think you'd find quite interesting. So early in the 20th century, you had uh, Albert Einstein, who used to run around uh, giving his, his theory of relativity equals mc squared to all the universities on the East Coast. He really did a good, decent kind of a job. But he was dri driven around to these different universities by a chauffeur. And uh, the chauffeur one day told him, he said, Albert, you know, your, your, your content is really, really good but your delivery basically sucks. So he said, at the next university, why don't we exchange places and I'll dress up as you, you dress up as me, and uh, we'll do the, you know, do the event. So the next, the next university after they went from Princeton was to MIT. The chauffeur dressed, dressed up as Albert, Albert dressed up as a chauffeur, and he went and sat at the back of the room. And the chauffeur gave this presentation, it was absolutely brilliant. You know, it was really like a standing ovation. It was so good, you know, top-notch delivery. But this is MIT, guys. You know, clearly there was this bright young person at the back of the room who stood up and said, and asked this deep, complex question in physics. And the chauffeur said, you know, showing the presence of mind, started laughing. He said, oh, that's such an easy question. That's such a simple question. I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> but the, the reason I bring that up is, you know, if fundamentally in your day-to-day -day world, it's all about keeping your presence of wit, uh, keeping your presence of mind, and really, like it's been said by the other speakers, is this ability to really move the ball forward. So I'll, I'd like to share a little bit about my personal experience because that's the only thing that I can comment on. You know, I joined Compaq in 1984 as a product manager. My uh, boss was a lady named Mary Dudley. The only reason that's interesting is that uh, her husband is now the CEO of British Petroleum in London. But um, so you know, she's really good. I was uh, learning the ropes as a young you know engineer with an MBA. Things were going well, and then she decided to leave. Um, and then I got this, I got this um, boss, this new guy, who came in completely clueless about technology. And he would just kind of second guess everything. And um, you know, Compaq at that time had done around uh, 200 million in revenues. And then I decided uh, at that time, when I was actually the product manager on the 386, to introduce that product ahead of IBM. It was very, very exciting because you're always considered a clone. So what is the leadership thing to do? As a leader, you need to leapfrog what the market uh, leader is doing, you know, don't just sit in their wake. So I approached the uh, VP of engineering and I said, and he happened to be employee number five. And the reason I bring that up is I'll close the loop on it. He said, I said, look, I'd like to move into, you know, even though I'm in product management, I'd like to move into an engineering role. It's, it's going to be a new experience. And he, I was working with him and he said, hmm, this guy is a hardworking guy. And like um, Farhat was saying, you know, my principle at work when I was working is really to give that 150, 120 percent because everybody was smart. And the question is, how do you advance, uh, you know, and move forward and really work, outwork, outthink, outsmart everybody? So I joined, joined him, and then um, you know, he happened to then rise as, to be the number two executive in the company, and then kind of pulled me along. So the key takeaway from that message is that it's extremely important that you are trying to get ahead in the corporate world is you must have a mentor. I don't care how smart you are, how brilliant you are, but having a mentor is very, very important. And that mentor could be your immediate boss, that mentor could be a, a, a vice president level person, typically somebody who's seen the ropes, moved around. But to get to that area, you need to do a couple of things. So one of the things I decided early on, because the company was going through tremendous growth, just to give you the level of growth, Compact went from 111 million in revenues to 25 billion in, in 15 years. And I never held a job for more than two years doing the same thing. So, but one of the things I learned as the company is in high growth mode is that it was very important to do internal partnering. You know, we all do external partnering, partnering with Microsoft, partnering with Intel, 
but that internal partnering that happens with your peers. So one key thing that I did is every every month I would go try to have a meeting with one of the vice presidents. You know, I was, uh, you know, young director. I said, you know, what is it that makes this person take it? It was outside my sphere of influence. I didn't know anything about operations, uh, finance, uh, you know, services. But the goal was to understand how this company operates so that at some point in time, if I happen to be, you know, moving up the ladder, that I could speak more intelligently about those various aspects. You know, learn to learn, talk about the balance sheet, learn about the income statement, learn about what's happening. So that internal partnering is very important. And I'll tell you why that a style is critical here. You know, one of the things that happens in meetings is that typically somebody makes a comment and the normal instinct that I have witnessed in my careers is uh, somebody says, I strongly disagree with you. So, you know, now when you make that statement, you actually personalize it. You said, I, so it's me, strongly disagree with you. So if you actually put that person on the defensive and I guarantee you before that meeting is over, he's already thinking, how am I gonna get back at this guy in front of all the other people, right? So it was clear that you can feel the tension, unnecessary tension, because, you know, when you're working in a company, the enemies are outside the walls. <laughs> you know, for me, it's EMC, right, at NetApp. <laughs> I'm not worrying about my people at, at NetApp. So one of the things I realized is maybe the better way to approach that subject is to say, look, um, I, I respect what you said, but I would like to share my opinion on the subject. So it immediately put everybody at ease, not being defensive about trying to challenge the other person, but giving your point of view uh, was very important, right? So that made a huge difference in style. It made people more comfortable. The peers got comfortable. The bosses got comfortable. Said, hey, this guy really wants to work. And you know, the point being, fundamentally, at the end of the day, my friends, none of us is as smart as all of us. You know, we are all working together for the common cause of winning in that particular company, whether it's software, hardware, chips, whatever it is, you're trying to win, right? That's what. There's no more competitive intensity in the entire universe than the technology industry, I can tell you. Because the big guys are trying to crush you, the startups are trying to eat your lunch. So unless you pull together as a team every day to execute the plan, it's real simple. And I'll tell you what uh, some of my mantras are. You either flawlessly execute or get executed. You either create dust or you eat dust. You can either decide to dine at the table or be on the menu. You know, the choice is yours, right? The other point I, I learned in my career is that frequently issues come up for one particular reason. You, know, you get that email and typically you have that, you know, you don't understand it properly uh, or you misunderstand it or you lack the understanding. And, you know, we, are, we immediately want to react and say, you know, let me, let me think about sending back this flame, flame mail. And so the point at that particular point in time, you should get up, you know, walk around your cube go drink a cold glass of water. If you're still angry and frustrated, please go and look at your face in the mirror and you'll understand why God has a sense of humor. <laughs> so the, before you send that email, you know, the goal is to respond, not to react, right? Because with the minute you send that uh, flame email, you know, the escalation level starts. So one of the conscious things that, I, that I've done, and, and I'm relatively new to NetApp, I've been there only nine months, is Never lose the informality of connecting. With the, it's, the point has been made again and again. It, it's a people business. So when I have an issue, before I send the email, I pick up the phone and I call that person and said, hey, I, I really didn't get that. Can you help me understand it? Versus saying, you know, what, what on earth are you talking about? Right? So reaching out and making that connectivity is very, very important because fundamentally, the people who connect and can work with others are the people who are going to rise up through a corporation. If you are a brilliant guy, but you don't know how to get on with other people, I can assure you, you're not going to get into senior management. You will be stuck at some level because ultimately it's pulling everybody together, right? If you can, even better, if you can walk and if that person is on the floor next below you or on a cube around the corner, go, go around and just say, hey, can I talk to you for a few minutes? We must maintain that personal connectivity. You know, all of us have our iPhones, iPads, we're on 24-7. Never lose that connectivity of a person-to-person, -person, uh, you know, face-to-face -face capability, right? Very, very important. And I think in the final analysis, uh, you know, every morning, like it's been said, um, you know, you want to go in with a winning attitude. You know, the, the reason you're in that company is to win. There, you, nobody gets prizes for coming in second. You want to win, so keep that just as an entrepreneur does, and I've been in uh, entrepreneurial companies, but keep the fire in the belly. You know, they need to see that you're excited, you're passionate about what you do, you're excited to learn. And you know, on the weekends, learn about the industry. You know, I spend every weekend uh, trying to learn about what's happening in the storage industry or the uh, technology industry in general, 
do a bunch of reading in the afternoon so that I can just keep abreast because there's so much happening, whether it's the mobile internet, cloud-based computing, it's really impossible, but it's so interesting for us in the tech industry that uh, just keeping abreast of what's happening is a, is a really good thing. So the net message is each and every one of you is a leader in his or her own right. Your goal is to fulfill your, fulfill your potential, right? That is your destiny. Uh, you know, uh, my last saying is the past is history. The future is still a mystery. Every day we get is a gift from God. That's why it's called the present. It's carpe diem. Seize the day, my friends. Thank you very much. that I find a common theme among clients who come to me is not understanding the difference between being smart intellectually and understanding